Hello, everyone. I am thrilled to be here. I see this as a really exciting time in our industry as two of my favorite things, coffee and science, formally come together. The formal incorporation of scientific approaches will better facilitate consistencies and innovation all along our supply chain from farm to cup. The evolution from that comforting hot cup of coffee every morning into all day enjoyment, whether it's in the form of more hot cups, lattes, iced coffees, single serve options, nitrogen infused, or cold brew, has come about because of a deeper understanding of how to manipulate the processing and flavor attributes of the coffee bean. With over 300 naturally occurring compounds in green coffee, and more than 1,000 when they're roasted, there are a lot of flavor iterations to be had within one blend. One particular cold preparation, as we've all heard, that is very hot right now, is cold brewed coffee. So, as both Peter and, and Diane have alluded to, there is a lot of growth and activity in this industry. What I would like to focus on today is around the food safety aspect and the unique challenges that arise in this method of brewing. So, let's take a step back. With all this activity and proliferation, and Diane alluded to this as well, is what is cold brew? To begin with, there is no standard of identity or formal regulation around what this process constitutes. By its name, cold brew, it implies the use of ambient or water that's not hot for the extraction. That means there's a wide range of water temperatures that can be used for this method. And today, there are three methods that are popularly used or most commonly used. The first one uses ambient or room temperature water. The second uses cold and or is done under refrigerated conditions. The third, and the one that's most questionable for me personally, is the hot bloom method. With this method, hot water is initially used to saturate the ground coffee and then it's immediately flushed with room temperature water. It seems counterintuitive to me that a cold brewed product would have a, an initial hot step, but without any formal regulations, these are all acceptable methods. Of course, the trade-off with all these methods of preparation is time. These are all very time-consuming processes, and some extractions actually take as long as 24 hours. So what happens in a few minutes with a hot brew takes hours, and it's extended to many hours in some cases for cold brew. And this gives rise to a very unique issue that is not present in the hot counterpart food safety. So before I delve further into this, I do want to emphasize that my intent here is to inform and not alarm you. I'm hoping to help build a broader awareness of the risks involved with what could be a really great category, but we really need to understand the risks, and I will present some of the ways that we can mitigate those risks. So one of the reasons that cold brew is an issue from the respect of food safety is that you use ambient temperature water. Yeast, bacteria, mold can all grow and survive at these temperatures. Notice that this would not be an issue with hot brew because the hot water would eliminate this risk. So ambient temperatures encompass what's called the danger zone for microbial growth. And that's between 4 and 60 degrees Celsius or 40 to 140 degrees Fahrenheit. Notice that you will also, our lovely psychrophiles will actually grow at refrigerated temperatures. And so you need to keep note that you can have microbial growth occurring in your process once they enter your system. So for example, have you ever left something, a food product in your refrigerator long enough that when you reached for it, it reached back? Great, that got on. Um, hopefully that is not a common occurrence with anyone. But I think for most of us, we've left cheese long enough to see it change color due to mold growth. So it's definitely something we need to be cognizant of. So coffee will support the growth of pretty much any microorganism, whether it's Staphylococcus, Pseudomonas, E. coli, coliforms. And as you can see from what can show up if you don't clean your coffee maker properly, that's not a pretty picture or something you want to see. If there's any particular group that could be problematic for coffee, 
It may be the lactic acid bacteria family because they actually are particularly tolerant in high acid systems. Either way, with proper processing and sanitation, you'll get the results of not having any growth. So again, there is opportunity to mitigate these risks. You just need to understand what you're undertaking. So what are the sources of microbial contamination? The water that you use, the containers and the equipment used in the processing, the environment, they're ubiquitous, they're everywhere. The personnel, your hands, you know, we are carriers as, as humans. And even other ingredients that you could be using in your process, such as sugar. Basically, if you have a source of either energy and water, you will get microbial growth. The key is to ensure that you understand how you're handling your product so that you can prevent some of these things from happening. And if not properly managed, you will end up with either product spoilage or illness. So it's just really key that once you're aware of these potential occurrences, that you want to not have neg a negative impact on your product and you want to ensure that you have a good tasting, safe product going out the door. So as I mentioned before, microbial growth can occur in one or two things of happening. Either you have non-pathogenic bacteria, such as lactic acid bacteria, yeast, mold, getting into your product and causing it to taste really bad. Or you can have pathogenic strains, such as Salmonella, Listeria monocytogenes, Bacillus cereus, to name a few, that could get in, and now you have an unsafe product. The scary part with the pathogens is that you will not taste them if they're present even if you're a super taster. You know, you will not feel the effects or see the effects of pathogenic contamination until hours later. And think of all the product that could be going out the door and you now have a recall on your hands. Not a good situation. So again, to put this in proper perspective, food safety is a concern across the board for anything that we consume, right? This is not unique to this industry, however, Traditionally, I think the coffee industry has enjoyed the luxury of this being a virtual non-issue because it has always involved a heat treatment of some kind somewhere along the preparation of the product. That's not the case with cold brew, per se. Additionally, coffee is known to have inherent antimicrobial properties. Not sure on the exact mechanism of how that occurs, but that does bode well for a safe product once you handle it properly. So what are some of the things that we can do to prevent the growth or even introduction of bacteria into your system? Once you have a rigorous cleaning program where you are cleaning all of your equipment, you're following good sanitation and good manufacturing practices, you can do a lot to eliminate, if not really reduce the risk of even introducing bacteria. Unfortunately, because they are ubiquitous and they are everywhere, Unless you're working in a sterile environment, you need to take the precautionary measures, even if you've done all the due diligence, depending on how you're packaging your product, you need to understand what are the different things that you can take once it's brewed that could possibly be done to help kill any bacteria that may have gotten into your system. So there are several methods. You have heating and pasteurization, pH less than 4.6, which is basically making your product more acidic, aseptic processing and or packaging, or any combination of the aforementioned measures that I just talked about. Of course, cost is always a consideration, and depending on your business model, you want to ensure that you're doing whatever fits into your business model, as well as something that will result in a safe product, but also taste, taste good. So, as I'm talking about heating, acidification, you know, these great process control points from a food safety standpoint, I know a lot of you are probably thinking, there's no way that when you add heat and acid, my cold brew is going to hold up. You know, these are seen, I think, cold brewed product tends to be seen as a more delicate profile that may not tolerate these kinds of processes. So, gosh, if you put heat and acid, it could really diminish the qualities, my positive flavor attributes of a cold brew product. But do they? So this is where science geeks like me get really excited because we did some very preliminary work where we looked at three different coffee blends. 
And the only difference was looking at a hot brew versus a cold brew. And we compared that in infrared analysis. So with the first sample, you'll see what we would typically expect as far as what we know today. The hot brew method extracted more compounds than the cold brew method. Interestingly enough, they both extracted the same compounds. On the second sample, a little bit different phenomenon. In this case, the cold brew curve was actually higher than the hot brew. So that means the cold brew method extracted more components out of the coffee than the hot brew. The difference is not as large as in the first sample, but this is definitely different to what was popularly believed before. Similarly for sample three, the cold brew curve again is on top. The difference isn't quite as big, so I think in this case, the brew methods are actually comparable in the amount of components that they're pulling out of the coffee. So some of the preliminary takeaways then from this study. Regardless of brew method, they're extracting the same compounds out of the coffee. What did vary was the amount that was extracted. However, as you saw with at least two of the three coffees, it is not solely derived by the brew method. And in some instances, the cold brew is actually extracting more components out of the coffee. So what does this mean? Well, from a process control standpoint, depending on your profile and what you learn about your coffee, as you apply the information, it's very possible you could have coffee profiles that are tolerant to heating and pasteurization. And then depending on the kind of acids you add in the combination, you could potentially acidify a product and not have a negative impact. But that's why it's such an exciting time for the role of science in the industry. Obviously, a lot more research needs to be done, but there is so much more to be found, and there's just really cool areas of research that I know personally I'm dying to get started on. So one of the last things I wanted to cover was with respect to how to engage a food safety expert so that you can ensure that your program is within compliance. There's a third party regulatory body called a processing authority, and they can give oversight and regulatory compliance. For most producers that file with FDA, they're able to engage one of these processing authority bodies, and they do what's called challenge studies, as Diane mentioned, and you can use pathogenic microorganisms. They customize these studies based on your process layout, and they give you that balance between optimal quality as well as a safe product. So to wrap up, I hope we've established that cold brew is a very unique item, very unique category potentially, but we do need to understand and take the proper food safety measures, understanding that there are distinct quality differences, but we need more science to support how we apply these different uh, measures to ensure it's not only a safe product, but also a great tasting one. Thank you.